¿Te preocupas por tu familia? Entonces, ¿por qué darle solo huevos ordinarios cuando pueden disfrutar de lo mejor? Egglands Best, los únicos huevos con ese delicioso sabor fresco de granja, además de la mejor nutrición, como 6 veces más vitamina D, 10 veces más vitamina E y 25% menos de grasa saturada que los huevos regulares, además de muchos otros nutrientes importantes. Así que, dales los mejores huevos. Egglands Best, mejor sabor, mejor nutrición, mejores huevos. Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo, discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. Quick little follow-up on the new quote-unquote ad system uh, <laughs> that I mentioned last week. Mm -hmm. That's harder than it sounds and more expensive than it sounds. <laughs> Um, and this has been a kind of a really rough week for time. Uh, day 233 sober today, by the way. Woohoo. All right. But uh, uh, as a lot of people know, I'm in a 12 step program and I did step five this week, which was very time consuming and very emotionally draining. So I did not get around to doing a whole lot of work, but I'm reaching out to everybody that wrote in and we're just going to manually do it. Fuck it. Okay. Uh, that's uh, the way it's going to happen. But I've also, got, you know, for the uninitiated, Jason, what is step five? Uh, none of your business. <laughs> okay. I'm sure I can Google it. <laughs> you can Google it, but it's no, the, the, uh, step five is basically that, that part where you sit down with another person and tell them every horrible thing you've ever done in your life. Oh, kind well, of, that sounds fun. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It was an emotionally draining week. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. But probably I feel, took I, a week. <laughs> no, <laughs> actually not that bad. I'm kidding. Human. You know. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, between, between three hours a day in recovery, two hours a day doing boot up and life. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been uh, been a kind of a rough week. So, uh, but I, I did determine that trying to build an automated ad system where people can just come in and do it self serve is really dumb. So, it's not okay. worth the effort. No, the juice isn't worth the, worth the squeeze, as you like to say. Yes, yes. No, you know what this is going to be. Uh, this is going to be me getting really, really good at text expander again. That's, <laughs> that's what it is. All so, right. Um, I did have a little bit of time on the crapper, which, uh, was, was perfect because I read Elon Musk's shadow rule by Ronan Farrow. When I saw this article come out, I was like, is there anything that we wouldn't possibly know having done this show for 10 plus years? TLDR? No. Okay. <laughs> didn't think Saved so. you an hour right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the only thing, and this is at the very end, which which everybody has kind of summarized and put into other articles, Elon really likes ketamine, which is probably why he's such a loon. Yep. That, that's about it. There you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of loons, though, uh, Firefest 2 tickets have gone on sale. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> no lineup, which only Coachella can get away with. Uh, no venue, no details, no nothing. Uh, it was only a hundred tickets at 500 bucks. Um, and it was doing the rounds that, uh, they had sold out to which I responded on Twitter where I saw that or X where I saw that or whatever the hell we're calling it. So you're telling me a notorious person who, for lying, who was convicted of fraud is basically saying <laughs> that he's sold out his tickets and we're just going to believe him. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. All right. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, Here's the here's here's his great plan too. The tickets get more expensive as you go. Yes. So get in early. Yeah. So the next drop is going to be for uh, seven hundred ninety nine dollars. If you wait for the last chance tickets, they will be get it, wait for it eight thousand dollars each. Except they and, won't because no, they this won't. is never going to happen. Absolutely not. There is here's, no insurer in the world that would touch this, and you need insurance to throw a festival. Are you ready for the grift and how I know <laughs> how I how I have sussed out where the grift is? Hmm. Under the tickets is the merch. Right. He's going to make his money on the merch. The two hundred dollar plus twenty five dollars shipping hoodie for the fire festival. Something that is something you might actually get. Might I know I would consider folded. buying one. <laughs> See, I think that's where the grift comes in. He's just going to be selling merch and then cancel the cancel the show again. How then, is he yeah. not doing an NFT? How? 
I think he, I think he, even he knows. That's too grifty even for him? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) NFTs are too grifty for the king of grift. (laughs) Unbelievable. Mm Mm-hmm. What a world. What a world. Indeed. Indeed. But hey, man, those cheese sandwiches are going fast. (laughs) Bring your own tent. Yeah. And musical instruments because nobody's going to play it. (laughs) Nobody's going to be playing. Nope. Bring a harmonica. Oh, God. Uh, Greg sent this in, and I thought it was pretty funny. He says, I can never think of chat GPT any other way now. And this is a, a graphic from uh, Twix or Twitter or X. I, know. I think it's Mastodon. Originally from Mastodon. Oh, reposted, yes. Reposted. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Life is extra surreal for French speakers right now because in French, phonetically, chat GPT sounds exactly like cat I farted. <laughs> chat GPT. <laughs> Everywhere, on TV, in the news, people are going, cat, I farted, over and over with a straight face. Is cat, I farted, going to steal your job? How are schools dealing with cat, I farted? Lawyer caught using cat, I farted. It's incredible. (laughs) It's originally posted by Phil Fish on Mastodon, yes. Well, that's fun. Yes, that is. Yep, and I posted a little link in here and follow up because we're not really going to talk about it. It's the Internet's next great power suck over at the Atlantic. Um, I, I'm not talking about it because we've been harping on about this for a while, about how AI is is, is the new is the new crypto sucking up all the power. But I hadn't really seen a lot of articles talking about it until now, so it's good to see one. So once again, we, we're right. Yeah, it would be nicer if we got the credit for it and everybody said, hey, I, I heard over at Grumpy Old Geeks they were talking about the... The carbon Power footprint. consumption and the, okay, yeah, yeah, and wow, no. how this is really a problematic, and we should be looking and talking about no, no, no. In the news, and Brian, just who's helping fuel all that carbon emissiony goodness? Idiots. Nvidia. Oh, them too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Apparently, they the they little didn't... graphics card company that could. I know. I am so mad that I sold my stock. I'm so happy I still have mine, even though it's making the world burn. Oh, uh, yeah. I bought it at 118, I think. <laughs> I think I bought it at 118. Oh, that's so sad. So sad. Um, that was the year that we did the the Twitter uh, yes, stock. Yes, our, our big stock competition. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That seems like a decade ago now. Mm-hmm. Might have been. Uh, NVIDIA just made $6 billion in pure profit from their their GPUs. Wow. wow! Wow! I thought I thought they maxed out on GPUs during the the uh, the blockchain boom, but apparently they were keeping something in reserve. And since the crypto bros aren't buying anymore, they uh, have been it's a good secondhand them market. <laughs> well, these are these are all new and exciting. You right. know, they're they're re re releasing new ones because I guess I don't know why nobody's picking up the mountains of old ones that the Bit Bros have abandoned. <laughs> um, who knows? Maybe they have resold them. You Maybe no. They probably have. Probably yeah. have. They they actually they they minted them into NFTs and then destroyed them <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and sold the NFTs. No, it's ridiculous how much these things are going for now. I mean, and you hear these people like they're doing you know twenty thousand GPU farms, and it's like for how? what? For what? For cat I farted? Yeah, for cat I farted. That's okay. right. It's it's insane, but uh, yeah, yeah. You go Nvidia, Intel, and AMD are just like going fuck. <laughs> I know, it. I know. Nvidia just killed it. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, well, I found this article over at Gizmodo, which as I'm going to discuss a little bit later, are absolutely killing it with their headlines. Like they're funny. They're really mm-hmm. funny, so they must be using Cat Eye Farted to write them or something. Yeah, exactly. Or they hired a really good editor. But what's even better than a funny headline are the fact that they're cra- they're crafting their headlines so you don't even need to read the article anymore. It's yeah. all You get it all from the headline. Godfather NFTs weren't enough to prevent Recur from sleeping with the fishes. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. So this is a... This is another one of those stupid companies that's calling it quits after years of pumping the internet full of monetized images. Uh, they license stuff from like The Godfather. They license stuff from all kinds of different places. Thought they were going to make a killing. Dead. Gone. Mm-hmm. Bye bye. They're taking all their websites offline. They promised that users should still be able to access their very expensive NFTs for their uh, using peer to peer open file shared network IPFS. So if you uh, move your stuff, or I guess maybe they're going to move it for you, doubt it. Uh, yeah. You can keep your stupid NFT that's not worth anything anymore. 
I love this. Already, users are unable to buy or sell their favorite Tommy Pickles NFT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about nice. it. Uh, speaking of people in a pickle, mm -hmm. Sam Bankman Freed is getting pickles on his peanut butter sandwich. Oh man, he's uh, he's whining about not being able to uh, get a real a real meal out there in Brooklyn's metropolitan detention. You're center. in jail. Yeah, well, you know, I think they they should have bunked him with the uh, the shaman guy from the the Capitol insurrection because he bitched about his vegan diet too. Right. So he survived. Sam, you're going to survive too. The one thing that they are saying is he hasn't been getting his meds, okay. which he should be that getting is his true. meds. He should. You know, mm -hmm. I, that one, yeah. But the diet, go fuck yourself. You should Seriously. be getting his Ozempic and all the other things that he was taking. Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> Don't God. Do anything. Just buy him a <laughs> bottle of insurance, slip it through the bars. <laughs> there you go. Well, somebody else that's going to jail, the crumbling crypto empire the tech bros everywhere once hyped up has now claimed another victim. Nathaniel Chastain, former head of product at leading NFT marketplace OpenSea, has been sentenced to three months in prison for insider trading on his Aww. NFTs. So he knew what was coming down the pipe. He, he knew what was going to be uh, like highlighted on the homepage, and he would buy a few first and then offload them when the demand was super high for them. Oh, you dumbass. It's and get this. He did all that, and he only made $50,000. You moron. That's it. You moron. You burned your life to the ground for fifty grand. Well, three months isn't really burning your life to the ground. Well, who's going to hire on. this fucker? <laughs> Anybody that sees oh, that's true. on I'm his sorry. NFT is not going to hire It's going to be on the board at X soon. <laughs> oh, oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, you know what, guy? When you're in when you're in jail for three months, I want you to Google if they give you a laptop or you get to go to the library. Arms length transaction. <laughs> Figure it out, you dumb motherfucker. Well, if only he had used Tornado Cash, which is my next story. <laughs> <laughs> the DOJ is charging Tornado Cash co-founders for laundering over one billion. In crypto. Now, if you're going to break the law. Now, that's how you do it. You, you, you go for a bill, not 50K. Yeah, I'm just seriously. saying. Now, the funny thing about this article, which I got from Engadget, is they have changed the name of the company from Tornado Cash to Toronto Cash throughout the entire article, which uh, <laughs> as I'm sitting in Toronto, I was like, what's going on here? Anyways, uh, it's a they were a cryptocurrency mixer, which are the people that basically white well, basically yeah. launder your money, your, yeah, also, your crypto also money. As, yeah, also known as a tumbler. Yeah, yeah, or a tumbler. So uh, they found yep. that uh, they're alleging that Toronto Cash, Toronto <laughs> Cash facilitated $1 billion in money laundering, including $455 million fundled through the mixer by North Korean cybercrime organization, the Lazarus Group. The mm -hmm. overall charges include conspiracy to commit money laundering, conspiracy to commit sanctions violations, and conspiracy to operate an unlicensed money transmitting business, which is what all of these things are. Anyways. That's, what, that's what Bitcoin is. <laughs> yes. <an> unlicensed. <laughs> Jesus, took him huh. long enough. That's 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 the same as when you get pulled over by a cop and he just cites you for improper lane usage. It means nothing. It's it means a catch nothing. All. Yes. Yeah. Jeez. And then I found this article, which I thought was interesting because they didn't really come at it from the perspective that I thought they were going to come at it from. Uh, this is the era of food delivery is fading. And I thought this was going to be all about like Uber Eats and, and all those companies that are tanking, DoorDash, et cetera. But it's just it's a higher level. They're basically just saying even the companies that were doing delivery themselves, Domino's is even in trouble. People don't want food delivered anymore. It's too expensive. Uh, yep. It shows up cold, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. And it, it's just tanked. Chipotle, Cava, Sweetgreen are all reporting significant de de declines in delivery sales. Uh, why the fuck you would have Chipotle delivered to you is beyond me. Yeah. Get off your fat ass. Uh, like, And basically, that is exactly what's happening. Like, It's just tanked. So I, I suppose they could pivot to sending vegan food to jails. Yeah, they could do that. They could yeah. definitely do that. Get some sweet I've, green in there. Yeah, oh, God. I have noticed that, yeah, I've, mine has definitely calmed down because – it, it yeah, it's way too expensive. There's so many fees. It's it's, it's so like it's expensive. like ticket master. It's, yeah, it's like double the price. Like, yeah, and you know the but the biggest issue for me is they always fuck up the order. They fuck you with the drive through and they fuck you with the delivery. You know, <laughs> it's uh, I because uh, I get paquito mas once a week, and you know God, by the I time I get home. Mas. Yeah, I want it so bad right now. The fucked up thing is I'm tired and I want to go home and I want to order my Paquito Moss, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I drive by the fucking Pequino house <laughs> on my way home. You know, I I, I have rediscovered pickup. <laughs> can yes. I place an order order for pickup? Well, it's so easy now. You can place the order on the app or through a website, and it's waiting for you. You don't even have to stand around the five minutes it takes together to put the burrito. Like, it's I just, there. Well, it's ready. It, just walk in. Yeah, and, you know, I could do that with the DoorDash app, but then I'm like, why am I giving these fuckers a cut, you know? Exactly, yeah. And then I thought about it. I'm like, well, it's Paquito Moss. They are kind of a big corporation, so kind of screw them. I don't care. I don't care either way. And then I thought, yeah, yeah, they're actually not that big. So, (laughs) but any mom and pop store, like my local, uh, my my favorite Mexican place in the world, Sola Luna, Mm -hmm. those guys I just call, you know, my sushi place, I just call and I just go pick it up. It's so much cheaper. Yes. So much cheaper. And Again, the order is right. It's tech bros reinventing things that don't need to be reinvented and then charging a lot for it. Yeah. Well, COVID's picking back up, so who knows? These guys That's might true. Be, <laughs> these guys true. might be back in business before you know it. Yeah. Well, I thought this article is really interesting as well. The US government regulators reportedly tried to come to an agreement with TikTok to prevent banning the app that would have granted the federal government vast powers over the app. So I went through this entire article, and here's here's the kicker. Many of the concessions the U.S. government asked of TikTok look eerily similar to the surveillance tactics critics have accused Chinese officials of abusing. (laughs) So so the whole plan was, uh, let us do what they're doing. Yeah, can we just get the same access as the Chinese, and then we'll call it a day? Yeah, the agreement would have let agencies examine TikTok's U.S. facilities, records, and servers with minimal prior notice and veto the hiring of any executive involved with leading TikTok U.S. data security (laughs) organization. Any company would be like, fuck that. (laughs) No way. (laughs) Jesus. Unbelievable. But, you know, give them points for trying, I suppose. (laughs) Seriously. Hey, no ASCII, no Getty, you know. No ASCII, no Getty. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) All right. Now, so circling back to Gizmodo and their killer headlines that they've been doing, I'm not going to read anything from these articles except for the headlines because it nails it. Peloton's business is as busted as its bike seats. Right. Perfect. Zoom CEO says employees need to be in the office because it's hard to build trust over Zoom. (laughs) Perfect. Perfect. And a space junk removal mission got struck by a space junk. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Great. I love these guys. Yeah. (laughs) No, they're doing pretty good over there. They're taking – you know what I think happened? I think somebody from the New York Post got fired and they they jumped ship over to Gizmodo. Those I, I are, think there's definitely yeah. a new editor over there because Gizmodo's headlines used to be just pretty normal. <laughs> These are awesome. <laughs> then you look Then you look at Engadget and Tornado becomes Toronto. Yes. So <laughs> we know who's winning that. I got to go cha- – I got to swap up my RSS feed and go back to Gizmodo, I think. Yeah, I think you should, man. It's pretty good right now. It's, it, I get a chuckle every time I open the page. Uh, I saw this one this morning. I just had to laugh. Introducing Code Llama, a state-of-the-art large language model for coding. Now, if you put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, this sounds in either like a gently named feature or a cheesy spy thriller or even just a weird Al cover of like a B-52 song. Code Llama! <laughs> or introducing Code Llama. <laughs> I'll I don't know why that that just made me laugh this morning. <laughs> That's pretty good. I can hear tin roof rusted in my head now, and it's yep. going to be stuck there for a fucking month. Thanks, You're Jason. welcome. You're welcome. Tin roof rusted. <laughs> Everyone needs a world-class VPN. Grumpy Old Geeks recommends private internet access to protect your online privacy and identity. Private internet access never keeps any records of their users' online activities, so you can be assured that you have complete privacy and nobody knows what you're doing online. No matter your technical skills, private internet access is one of the easiest VPN apps out there. All it takes to connect is just one click or tap and your data will be encrypted instantly. With just one private internet access VPN subscription, you can connect up to 10 devices at the same time. Go to GOG.show slash VPN and sign up today. For a limited time only, you can get our favorite VPN for just $2.69 a month when you sign up for two years. GOG.show slash VPN. That's GOG.show slash VPN. 
¿No se merece tu familia lo mejor? Entonces, ¿por qué no los mejores huevos? Ahora, Egglands Best están disponibles en deliciosas opciones. Huevos clásicos de gallina libre de jaula y orgánicos de Egglands, que ofrecen un sabor más delicioso y fresco de granja que le encantará a tu familia. En comparación con los huevos ordinarios, Egglands Best contiene la mejor nutrición como 6 veces más vitamina D, 10 veces más vitamina E y el doble de omega 3 y B12. Solo Egglands Best. Mejor sabor, mejor nutrición, mejores huevos. Visita egglandsbest.com para más información. Media Candy. Well, Brian, we talked about that really cryptic ending on the peripheral and how, how we couldn't wrap our head around what the fuck was going on. And we're like, well, we're going to find out in season two because season two is already greenlit and they're going to make another one. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> well, it solved my problem. I was really on the fence. Would I watch it when it came back or not? And now I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I I mean, the first one was was beautifully shot. I liked it. I, I was actually going to go back and watch it again because I, I, you know, wanted to get caught up and see if I could figure it out on my own because I'm not a dumb guy, but I just was befuddled by the ending. If like, only there were a book work? that has the story. Yeah, but it didn't. I but mean, it that, didn't because they kind of uh, went off the rails. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. They foundationed it at the end there. Pretty much, um, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, no, they're blaming they're blaming the strike on it. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but yeah. You know, I, I'm starting to sour on uh, the Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan team up here and all yeah, the shows that, that they're coming up with. It's, <laughs> it's, they're just unsatisfying and they're weird and they never they're, they're doing what uh, Lindoff always does, like with Lost. You create this whole thing and then you just don't explain it. Yeah. It, well, sometimes you explain it too much. Like Westworld did not yeah. need the last episode. They finished it at the penultimate episode. Westworld didn't need the last couple seasons. Seasons. <laughs> Let's be <Yeah>. honest. <laughs> This is true. This yep. is true. Yeah. Well, something I am happy coming back. The Frasier revival has set its premiere date at Paramount Plus. Uh, it will be coming out on October 13th or actually October 12th in the U.S. and Canada and October 13th everywhere else. And they will also air the first two episodes back to back on CBS on October 17th, assuming for the people that were old the, when the first Frasier came out and still yeah. aren't on board with streaming. Now, they're calling it a revival, but the only person coming back is Frasier. That Nobody else revival. is in it. <laughs> no, that's a cover band. With yeah. Just one guy left. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that, that is the, the legal minimum they have to do to call it Frasier. That's what it is. Pretty much. But I'm excited because it was one of the most well-written shows uh, that's ever aired on TV. I mean, it's just it's it's nice and comforting and funny. And I'm hoping that the writers are I'm hoping they have some of the same writers because it was good. Never saw an episode. Oh, man, you missed out. Yeah, that's what they say about Friends, too. Never saw an episode. Ah, that. fuck Friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, the strike also claimed Dune Part 2 mm. because uh, the problem is nobody will be around to promote it. So they're going to push it till next year, unfortunately. Hey, unless COVID comes out and then maybe we'll get it on Max. <laughs> it's fine. That's how I watched it the first one. So. Exactly. And again, if me. only there were a book that told you the story in case you were. <laughs> <laughs> Same book as the first one, it turns out. Same book, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah. I think good stuff. The, the big difference between now and then is I've got a 75 inch TV to watch it on. So I'm like, bring it on. That's a big fucking worm. <laughs> yes. <it is. laughs> that is not what she said. <laughs> Uh, so I was going through a little bit of withdrawal after the end of the Women's World Cup, and uh, Disney Plus had a documentary, Matilda's The World at Our Feet, all about the Australian women's team. And it was a, a couple episodes long. If you're into soccer, it was a great doc. I had a, lot of, I had a good time watching it. All right. Sounds so. like a foot fetish movie, but I'll take your word for it. Well, it is soccer. Yeah, that's true. You do see a lot of women's <laughs> feet in it. Yes, you do. Didn't think about Not that. Not recommending it for that <laughs> usage. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of like uh, heartwarming stories about empowerment, but hey, hey, you do you. Yeah, yeah. Moving on. <laughs> I, I botched that one. <laughs> uh, Devo, uh, the wonderful band Devo, has actually announced that this is their final tour. They're going to retire after 50 years together, which is uh, a bit sad. I don't know. It's a great band. I also heard that OMD, or Orchestral Maneuver in the Dark's upcoming album, Bauhaus Staircase, will be their last. Conveniently, I'm seeing both bands at that festival out in Huntington Beach in November, so I might be seeing uh, some of their final performances, which oh, is pretty cool. cool. Yeah. That's cool. I've never seen Devo or uh, OMD. They're so. both great live. Yeah. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. 
but you'll have to you 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 go watch it and tell me how good it is. I'll live I vicariously. Will. I'll take videos and put them up on the ticket the talk for you. I appreciate that. Then then all of the spy agencies can see them at the same time. That's right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Now, uh, YouTube and uh, YouTube came out with their whole AI music thing this week. We, yep. we, t- we, we touched on it a little bit before. So um, I, I, I highlighted the, uh, the press release here. I, I had a, There's an article that you can read or whatever, but this is from the press release. I want to mm-hmm. bear with me on this. One. Okay. Let me read the, read the title and then let me interject and then you can get into it. Our principles for partnering with the music industry on AI technology. AKA the rules they fucking gave us for using their content. AI is here and we will embrace it responsibly together with our music partners. Between the lines. We're tired of these fuck nuggets suing us and we want to <laughs> cut it off at the pass. Yeah, well, imagine that. Suing you for stealing their content and repurposing it. Hmm, who would have thought? Next line. <laughs> Today, AI is moving at a pace faster than ever before. It's empowering creativity, sparking new ideas, and even transforming industries. At this critical inflection point, it's clear that we need to boldly embrace this technology with a continued commitment to responsibility. Between the lines. We're fucked and we're going to throw some shit at the walls now. Also, Cat I Farted wrote that entire paragraph. (laughs) I think that Cat I Farted wrote the whole thing. Next one. For nearly our entire history, YouTube and music have been inextricably linked. Between the lines. Our users have been putting up pirated music since we started allowing uploads. That's That's so fucking true. (laughs) Next slide. Now we're working closely with our music partners, including Universal Music Group, to develop an AI framework to help us work toward our common goals. Between the lines. So Brian's wife stopped suing us. Dude, she's been in such a better mood since this deal was done. It was a fucking nightmare for her. Oh, that was great. In 2023 alone, there have been more than 1.7 billion views of videos related to generative AI tools on YouTube. Between the lines. We're so fucked and we're going to need a bigger bucket of shit. I like it when you work on work on bits, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Oh, that's that's what eight cups of coffee in the morning gets you. <laughs> oh God, we're going back to the coffee episodes. Oh God, I I, I just got my delivery yesterday of uh, I, I I've been drinking this Whole Foods uh, um, instant coffee, which is actually very tasty. But I've moved back to my Israeli instant coffee uh, called Elite, which is my favorite instant coffee. So the fucking Israelis do coffee really good. Coffee. And, and breaking everything that we love careful, and careful. know about. I love the Israelis. You know I love them. The term fucking Israeli is a term of endearment because they're so fucking clever. And now I know why they're so clever because they're on this fucking coffee all the time. It's commando coffee. It is. It really <laughs> – hey, if you ever watch the show Fauda, they all drink it on Fauda. Um, so Chris writes in, I just listened to episode four six or 614 and <laughs> – I also okay, have we're going to have to monitor coffee consumption again. <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to have to start every episode with how many cups did you have today, Jason? <laughs> I'm over-caffeinated, sober, and dyslexic. Fuck. Good times. I just listened to episode 614 and wanted to share a tip for Jason regarding Paramount+. Plus. I don't know if this is a new feature or what, but if you created your account through your Apple TV channels to get the benefit of seeing it under your subscriptions, which I did, you can now link your Apple channels login through their site to a Paramount account. As Thus, it sim- should be. Yes. Thus simultaneously granting access to content in the Paramount Plus app. Best of both worlds now. Shows up under Apple subscriptions and bypasses the semi-annoying channels for the app option. So thank you very much, Chris. I appreciate you. I love you. Oh, much better. Much fucking better. (laughs) Say it. I I can hear you sniggering in the back. It takes so little to get your love these days, Jason. (laughs) It does. Are you sad and lonely? I'm a sober alcoholic. Of course I am. (laughs) Shit. Ups and doodads. Well, thank fucking God. We've been waiting forever. Threads on the web is here. Woo! Doggy. No one cares. <laughs> Good luck trying to fucking log in if you've got two-factor turned on, though. Ain't yeah, happening. that's true. Good luck. You'll be able to post, interact with other posts, look at your feed, just like an actual website, spokesperson Christine Pye tells The Verge. <laughs> Welcome to 1996. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Mm. Oh. <laughs> well, at least they haven't changed the name yet. 
That's so, true. Yeah. Uh, I saw this one. This is a pretty good article. People are using Photoshop's generative fill to restore old photos. While generative fill wasn't specifically designed to fix old photos, clever creatives have shown that the tool can be used for that exact task. Link is in the show notes. I'd recommend checking it out if you've got Photoshop and a bunch of shit you're trying to fix. This is actually really helpful. Yeah, it is. It's pretty cool. It's a good use of the tech. I like it. It's very Blade Runner. It it really is. Enhance. Enhance. Mm -hmm. Cat I farted. Enhance. (laughs) (laughs) I saw this one that made my little heart smile. Leaked wipeout source code leads to near total rewrite and remaster. Oh, I loved wipeout. Loved wipeout so much. This is not the version of wipeout that I personally loved, which was wipeout Excel, the first one with the greatest soundtrack with the of all time, greatest game soundtrack ever made, ever made, and introduced the world to Red Bull, or at least in, introduced the U.S. and anybody that mattered to Red Bull. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Austrians, just just calling it as I see it. No shade. Uh, this guy Dominic Zabelski uh, took the source code that was leaked. And said, God, this is terrible, and rewrote it all. <laughs> so at this point, Sony has not tried to sue him since it's basically abandonware. Yeah. Um, but if they do want to do something, he's like, please, just take and remaster the damn game, which I'm all, I'm all for. Please, I, just give me, a, give me a 4K version of Wipeout Excel that I won't be able to play anymore because I'm old and slow. <laughs> but, right. yeah. Well, even if they wanted to sue him for this, it would probably take about 25 years because there's a backlog of frivolous fucking stupid lawsuits cl- clouding up the system, like this one I'm about to talk about. <laughs> okay. A judge has dismissed the lawsuit claiming Apple Watch blood oxygen sensor has a racial bias. Plaintiff Alex Morales said he believed that he bought the Apple Watch, believing its blood oxygen feature would work without regard to skin tone. However, the class action lawsuit was dismissed with prejudice, ironically, okay. mm-hmm. meaning yeah. it can't be brought forth against Apple again. It is known that there is a bias with light-based sensors. That's because they determine your metrics based on how light reflects off the skin. Melanin and tattoo ink impacts that. Although companies try to make up for it by fine-tuning algorithms. You know, cat I farted. Yep. So there you go. And basically, Apple basically has said this is for general wellness, a.k.a. it's just for fun. It is not a fucking, you know, medical-grade system. So Mm -hmm. shut up, basically. Yeah. Go go buy your own... You know, ten dollar pulse blood. oximer. Thing. Exactly, yeah. they're ten bucks on on Amazon. We've Everybody got, got them, them during COVID. You might have to get them out again. Seriously, you could probably get one used. Yes, <laughs> after somebody who's dead. You know, it's kind of <laughs> gross, but hey, just saying. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of lawsuits, though, uh, in uh, the U.S., a judge says that art created solely by artificial intelligence cannot be copyrighted. But I gave Yay. it a prompt. Yeah, I'm, exactly. No, that doesn't <laughs> cut it. And hmm. this guy, Stephen Thaller, uh, is the guy that brought the suit. And he's also the guy, if you remember the story a, a while back, where he wanted to have his AI tools be able to patent things. Yes, mm-hmm. yes he wanted he wanted his, his little AI to be, <laughs> oh, God, I don't like this guy. Uh, basically said that, yeah, we want it to be uh, patentable. And the, everybody on the planet says, no, Stephen, we need humans involved. That's the whole fucking point. So, well, look, I, yes. I don't I don't agree with the guy, but I'm happy he's doing all the things that he's doing because at least the stuff we're we're coming to conclusions. We're codifying it, we're figuring it out. And yeah, we're putting it probably, into law. We're yeah. putting it into law. So good on you, buddy. You keep Let's losing, keep it but <laughs> it works for us. The dark side. Ha! With Dave. We're back with Dave Bittner. Dave is the host of the Cyberware podcast, co-host of Hacking Humans with Joe Kerrigan, co-host of Caveat with Ben Yellen, and the host of Control Loop. Go to the Cyberwire.com for links to all of Dave's amazing shows, except no other. I do. <laughs> except no substitutes. <laughs> yes. That's right. <laughs> the, the one and only. <laughs> the... He, never, he never listens to more than one podcast at home. Yeah. Anybody remember that coffee commercial? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is funny. People often often ask me, what are my favorite podcasts? And I kind of look at them side eyed and say, you know, it's like the (laughs) the thing I want to do when I get home is listen to podcasts. (laughs) Yep. 
Uh, I, guess I do. I, I do actually like, listen to some podcasts. I was podcasts, say, I listen but, yeah. to a lot of podcasts, actually. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I mean, I do, but I... Weren't we just talking about it a couple of weeks ago, about how yeah. nobody listens to music anymore, and we're all listening to podcasts all the time? That's but, true. But I get it. Yeah. It's yeah. the gynecological yeah. joke. Yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And, I, and, and, and also, it's professional jealousy. I don't want to tell anybody what I like better than my shows. <laughs> mm. I mean, they're all inferior to what I do. But yes, <laughs> right, right. I'm just, I'm just listening to to make fun of them. To you know, those, those, and... those smartless fellows are kind of OK. I'm hate listening. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, smartless, I totally hate listened. <laughs> I, I don't think that's a very good show at all. I but actually quite enjoy it. It depends on who's yeah. on. Like most like most shows. I, yeah. Well, it's it's kind of like Mark Maron. I, I, I listen for the guest, not the host. Yes. But right. Anyway, guess what's out? Osaka, mm. I mean Asoka. I'm not even going to say the name because it's burned into my brain wrong, and I just get yelled at by people. But yeah. uh, two episodes, and it immediately became my favorite Star Wars thing ever. Okay, yeah, yeah. love it. Yeah, yeah. one, one episode, and I went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> we watched the two episodes over two nights and very much enjoyed them. Uh, my wife, in particular, is is on board. I think because there's just a ton of uh, three female leads. Right, exactly. Yeah. Broads, <laughs> lots of broads. Um, I saw a stat; it was the first uh, female on female uh, lightsaber fight in all of Star Wars. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. huh? I guess I hadn't really considered that, but yeah, neither had I. But there you go. <laughs> I say we just hand the franchise over to Dave Filoni and be done with it. Well, it I, is his I mean... <laughs> now, isn't it? I mean, they they basically canceled any movie that was going to be done by anybody else. And the only thing coming down the pipe is more shows from him, right? So, mm -hmm. Sounds mm -hmm. more yeah. like Dave Fallopian tube, if you know what I'm saying. Ha ha. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh -huh, yeah. uh, it was good. I'm curious if people that weren't familiar with the backstory are enjoying it as much as I am. I'd, I'd probably assume not. Although they didn't. You know, they're doing a good job of just making it about what's on the screen as opposed to needing to know everything that has come before in the animated series. But yes. Yeah. Well, to that point, uh, the day <laughs> day of the premiere, my son uh, sent me a YouTube clip, a half an hour YouTube clip that was basically everything you need to know before you watch Ahsoka. Right. <laughs> and it was so packed full of information and there was no way I could retain all of this stuff. But it made me realize how much Star Wars lore I don't know. And as a super Star Wars fan or a Star Wars super fan. Um, well, you're on a the movie one hand, purist. Exactly. The Holy Trilogy is <laughs> is where things begin and end for me. Um, and some of these new series. And, and I guess part of it is that. Uh, I never really enjoyed the prequels very much, and so that I think biases me against the Anakin Skywalker stories. Right, and so <clears throat> I watched most of Rebels, which I enjoyed. Uh, I've watched some of the Clone Wars, but not all of it, and so I, I didn't know a whole lot about Ahsoka going into this. But um, I, this half an hour video uh, got me up to speed to at least recognize a lot of the backstory. But yeah. Um, she's still definitely trying to learn most, everybody's names. <laughs> she's definitely one of the most interesting characters in all of Star Wars, if you have seen all those sort of things. And the interesting thing about, I think, the Clone Wars and Rebels, and I, I was reading some review and talked about this as well, is what a good job it does making the prequels look better because hmm. it fills in so much of the information that was just kind of glossed over and, you know, kind of force fed to us uh, by, you know, all this political crap and trade or federations and all of that. But when it's spelled out over this longer period of time in the Clone Wars and Rebels, it actually starts to make a lot of sense and it's interesting and it's fun and and it does a good job of basically making those prequel movies better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, and there's something wrong with your movie, though, if you need, you know, eight seasons of a show to explain your movie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, yeah, there's that. But... The show looks great. It sounds great. Uh, this, uh, the soundtrack I'm enjoying. There are lots of callbacks to little bits of – little musical motifs from the movies and the previous shows. And um, even It's funny you little... mentioned that actually. That was the yeah. one thing that bothered me was I felt that it was a little too Mandalorian, Boba Fett, Western soundtrack for what the show is. Okay. I do like the callbacks that they bring in. But like the main theme, I was kind of like, this doesn't feel quite right for this show. Interesting. My wife also mentioned she, she did not like the main theme. 
yeah. for the show. But, you know, I felt that way uh, originally about The Mandalorian. Right. And it and it grew on me and I came to like it. But initially I didn't – did not enjoy it. So I maybe that will like... happen with this one. But, yeah, I, you know, it, it's just that I think you can make cinema quality shows now for TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and so – there's no distraction of oh this is a low rent version of Star Wars. Yeah. No, like it's it's, it's everything and uh, more. Having gone back and watched uh, the prequels and the holy trilogy recently, let me tell you it's a lot better looking than Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I I got one thing and in the very beginning of the first episode uh to the music, I was I was listening to the the soundtrack behind it. I don't remember the opening theme. I'll try and listen again when I watch episode 2 again. Um, when she's getting the map, the scene where she's getting the map is very much, you know, indie in the map room. Mm-hmm. Right. And I mean, it is indie in the map room. Come right. On. Who the fuck are <laughs> yes. we kidding here? I, yes. I, well, I was thinking the same thing. We, the, we, the needed, we needed the big meteor rolling after. Her. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Saving that one for season two. Um, it was, uh. It, the music was what actually made me think of it. I'm like, man, they stole the music too. <laughs> and the music is mm. what brought me into it. I'm like, oh, oh, the map room. Yes. Um, uh, what's the guy? Is it Ray Stevens? The oh, the actor. The, yeah. Yes. I, I yeah. Think, I believe that's his name. He passed away, unfortunately. I know. I was yeah. so bummed because I, I recognized good. him, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, I love that guy. He was fantastic in Rome. It was the first time I ever saw him, and I loved him in Rome, and I loved him in a couple different things I've seen him in. I'm like, I'm so glad he's working again. What's he been up to? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Who does well, he play in this one? Uh, the bad Jedi, the, the oh. bearded guy. Oh, yeah, the big bad that, I did not know that. I didn't know he yeah. passed. Oh, he's good. Although, yeah. bad? Hmm. The, bad? Light, the, lightsabers, the lightsabers aren't pure red. They're kind of so. more orange. <laughs> okay. Just saying. Yeah, there was another um, thing that I I really liked that I thought was a callback, uh, like a Dave Filoni kind of callback, which is um, uh, if you've noticed Ahsoka's ship, the way that it tilts from one side to the other, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, which was originally how the Millennium Falcon was supposed to behave, mm-hmm. which is why the Falcon has a round cockpit. Um, some of the original, uh, if you go back to the the making of documentaries um lucas wanted it to fly around i think he used the word like a sunfish right and then when it would land it would tilt over and flat and land and at the time it was too much to do and too much work so it just flies around you know like they say like a hamburger um (laughs) but ahsoka's ship does exactly that thing that they originally wanted the falcon to do and i don't my guess is it's a deliberate callback just because of how detail oriented uh, they are with these sorts of things. So yeah. I thought that was fun. Yeah. So isn't cool. that uh, like the B-Wing? Doesn't the B-Wing it, do that? It's like it, yeah. It's, it's I not saw, – yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> just this week I, though, I saw somebody who made a B-Wing uh, remote-controlled plane that was mm-hmm. like like drone-ish. It was really cool and it was doing that and I was just like – You know and then, what? then I saw her ship and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Dude, Kids these see. days have it so good. No like you can, <laughs> you can get like Lego sets of B-Wings. Like when, when Star Wars came out, like for all of us, we had to go off like a blurry screenshot that somebody took of a ship way in the background and going, what is that? A Y-Wing? What the fuck is a Y-Wing? And we wouldn't and right. find out. And now you can get right. detailed plans and, and build one. And and we yeah. only had like four bricks to build it with. We right, didn't have exactly. all this custom shit. <laughs> all of my – yes, all of my Lego X-Wings back in the day were completely red because the, <laughs> the, those were the bricks I had. Right. Uh, yeah. It was a real revelation too when the first time I got – I got my hands on a pair of hinged Lego pieces because now the the uh, the X-Foils could open and close. This Ooh, was just a big tech. deal in my life. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. But uh, – yeah, I think yeah. I moved so, on by then. Very much enjoying it. <laughs> Never had a hinge. Okay, well, we'll keep up with it. Uh, you know, it looks uh, looks like it's here to stay, hopefully. Yep. It is. Well, you know, but uh, actually to that point, uh, my wife pointed out, she said, is this the last Star Wars thing we're going to have for a while because of the writer's strike? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I, uh, isn't there something ready to go? I can't remember. 
maybe not. Maybe know. that is it. So <laughs> and watch it slow. <laughs> watch it very, very slow. Right. Well, well it's going to have a limited run. It can't go on for too long because, well, there's a finite end to the story and they're supposed to wrap all of this up in a in an actual film that he's going to do, which is going to mm. it's going to be the Mandalorian crossing over with with this plot and and we'll see i mean that's the plan right now disney changes star wars plans as frequently as i change my underwear so right yeah. right that always bums me when i hear oh they're gonna make a film i'm like no <laughs> damn it it's gonna <laughs> suck the only time well, that it actually worked was deadwood they made the deadwood film and it was 100 percent perfect most <laughs> of them like firefly so they made serenity <laughs> right damn it <laughs> oh well yeah uh, I put this in here just for you, Dave, because uh, you were lamenting about the uh, the death of Wirecutter. And there's an actual article over at the LN called, What Happened to Wirecutter? And I thought, hey, I bet Dave would like that. So uh, there you go, Dave. Yeah, did it, that's uh, Did it enlighten you to the death of Wirecutter? It did. I, I will say I still make use of Wirecutter pretty regularly. It's among my go-to sites if, if there's something that I'm researching. Um I will say the the toaster oven that I have, which is the best kitchen appliance I have ever purchased in my life. Uh, <laughs> it's a Cuisinart. Um, and it's phenomenal. And I bought it because of wire cutter. Uh, what happened was my wife – this is several years ago. She's – for uh, Christmas, she wanted an air fryer. Air fryers oh, yeah. were all the rage. Oh, right? Right. Everybody yep. wanted an air mm-hmm. fryer. Mm-hmm. So she said, I want an air fryer for Christmas. And I said, great. So I went to wire cutter looked for best air fryer and wire cutter said the best air fryer is not an air fryer it's this toaster oven because air fryers are basically just convection ovens yes. right mm-hmm. um, so they said instead of buying an air fryer buy this convection oven it does everything an air fryer does and much more and damn if they were right it is the best <laughs> kitchen appliance <laughs> i mean we it gets so much use in our house and it does a great job so been a fan of the wire cutter for a while um, i'll share a personal story here um, years ago, this is probably around 2013, which is when Wirecutter first started up, I was having lunch with David Hobby, who some folks may know is the uh, operator of the Strobist website, which was a big deal – still is a big deal photo- – photographer's website. Mm-hmm. His whole thing is uh, off-camera lighting, teaching you how to light your, your photos um, using small portable flashes. David was extraordinarily uh, successful with this website, one of the first big blog websites that really took off and you know became his business. Uh, he was a former Baltimore Sun photographer, quit the Sun, took a buyout from the Sun to start Strobist and uh, it was a big hit. Anyway, he was friends with Brian Lamb who is the founder of Wirecutter and I believe he met Brian through the photography stuff. And I remember we were having lunch one day and just chatting about different opportunities on the web and how you make money. And he mentioned Brian Lamb who had just started this thing, Wirecutter, and they were just a few months into it. And Brian was saying that he was already making $30,000 a month on Amazon affiliate links and just was overwhelmed. At, like, what am I going to do with all this revenue? It just far <laughs> oh, exceeded. Oh, what am I going to do with all this money? Well, it just I exceeded his expectations. You know, yeah. it's like he had an idea. He was the first to come at it from the point of view of using the Amazon affiliate money to fund the site. Right. No one had really done that the way that Wirecutter did. Because nobody and, was making thirty thousand dollars a month from Amazon. <laughs> well, that's the thing. He, he took a risk and he did the work, and it worked. And to me, the the risk was always that Amazon would just pull the plug on them and yeah. they'd be done. Yep. And Amazon has not done that so far. But um, it's an interesting article, and and I think points to the problem of businesses when they need well businesses that get bought and the people who buy the business then want to scale the business, the success of the business is not enough for them because they paid a premium for the business. So they have to figure out how to scale it and in doing so – Break it. Break it. Yeah. Yep. Right. Or or they <laughs> take away the, the special something, the secret sauce that made it special. Mm-hmm. And um, I, it, like I said, I still go to Wirecutter. I still enjoy it. It's still one of the places that I go to. But I do understand what this article is saying that uh, – it, it doesn't seem as rigorous as it used to be. Right. Yeah. 
No, it's funny. Uh, Brian Lamb used to actually write for me when I did a site, Met Blogs, our first that first uh, citizen journalism project I did before Huffington Post. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I met Brian once when I first moved to San Francisco, said hi. Like, hey, we should get together. Uh, he was working at Wired across the street from my office. And uh, that was the last I've ever seen of Brian Lamb. He quit like two weeks later, and <laughs> now now he's Brian Lamb. Before he wasn't Brian Lamb. He was just right. this, guy, this kid, Brian, who wrote it every now and again on SF Met blogs. Right. So whatever happened yeah. to that guy? You know, it's yeah. like, yeah. For me, like with David Hobby, uh, I met David because our kids went to the same elementary school. And, um, you know, it's just Ooh, somebody yeah. Somebody said, oh, you should meet David. He's into photography. And, you know, then I, you know, oh, you're that David Hobby, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so got to be good friends. But it's funny how things work out. So, uh, Dave, you brought on the topic of billionaires before, so I'm going to bring in a topic this week. Mm. Um, hopefully it won't be uh, as divisive as the other one, but divisive meaning that I thought it was going to be divisive, but it turned out everybody hates billionaires. So <laughs> It's a pretty safe target. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Unless You're you have to punching be one. up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been – I've you know, been watching all this dystopian you know, stuff, zombies, all this crap because i got some new video games I'm playing. I'm just thinking, you know, as the world electrifies and we have electric cars, everybody's got power walls in their house, we have solar panels everywhere, all zombie fiction and dystopian fiction is going to have to be rewritten because there's not going to be this reliance on gasoline that we have that fuels most of the, you know, especially with zombies, it's like, you know, you turn on your car and woof, you're dead because it's loud. Now it's just like, you can get away from the zombies. They can't hear you <laughs> right. coming. Ah, but, but the zombies you know? will be caused by a meteor that slams into the earth and then kicks up enough dust that the solar stuff won't work anymore. Mm. See, that's not it, my story. That, you, can, you can write that in your story. Right. This is and my while story. it's on its way in, it, there's an EMP pulse <laughs> yes, that takes yes. out there everything we go. electronic. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> it just fries everything. So, okay. You guys, you yeah. guys do your story. Are you listening, mind. Walking Dead writers? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. You probably are because you're not working. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jason, you bring up a good nitpick of mine, though, that bothers me with uh, zombie fiction and movies and TV shows, especially things like The Walking Dead, which – uh, is kind of related to who's mowing all the lawns, right? <laughs> yes, um, yes. Uh, which is that gasoline goes bad. Ga exactly. Gasoline, yes, it you, does. <laughs> you, you can't store gasoline forever. Nope. Um, so actually to that point, I bought a um, little electric generator for my house, mm -hmm. uh, just a little portable one. And one of the things I was deliberate about was I got one that runs on both gasoline and propane mm, because yeah. propane does last pretty much forever. You can have – you know, you store a bunch of propane tanks outside of your house mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> propane doesn't go bad the way gasoline does. Right. Yeah. I have I, – I thought about that because I, I have a little generator as well that I just fired up last weekend because of the hurricane mm. that we had here and uh, – <laughs> You know, I when I was looking at the propane one, I'm thinking, you know, if it gets to the point where I need to power my home generator with propane, I probably am going to be wishing for death anyway. So let's just skip it <laughs> mm. and get the gas one and save the money and spend it on things that I can enjoy right now. I, that, that was that was my thinking. <laughs> that very much reminds me of what my mom told me when I was a kid. We were, you know, it was the height of, of nuclear terror, right? 19 or what was the movie? I can't remember. 1984. The day after. The day after. The day after. The day after yeah. Yes. Yeah. The day after it had come out, all that stuff. And, and I was like, you know, it, 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 as a kid, it, it makes you fucking freak out, right? And I, my mom was just like, oh, don't worry, honey. We live right here in Los Angeles. We're, we're going to get obliterated. Right? Yeah. You're not going to have to worry about it. <laughs> you're not going to have to worry about a thing. You're going to blink and be dead. Yeah, oh, mm -hmm. thanks, mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's comforting. Yeah, I got this. I got this. Yeah, I got the same same thing. I was living next to Oceana right. Naval Air Base, and uh, we're dead. Yeah, I was like, "Oh, we're, we are so dead so fast. Don't worry about it." <laughs> Just, yeah, the warmth that only a mother can provide. Yes, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a story for a different day. But yeah. uh, I just thought that you know, it, there's there's some there's some fun stories that could be had around this. You know, like. How how you know how society can be bifurcated between the preppers who have the tanks of gasoline and living out mm -hmm. in the woods with their you know their camo and everything and their MREs, and then you have the suburban people who are very 
you know, they're, they're community, they're friendly, they know each other, and they all have solar, they all have Teslas, and they're the ones that actually do well in the apocalypse because they can have their electrified fences, they have each other to, you know, share skill sets and things like that, and then you got the lone crack nut over here in the woods by himself <laughs> going, I'm going to outlast everybody, and they're like, <laughs> right, <laughs> gasoline goes bad in 90 days, and yeah, they're they're mm-hmm. sitting there having you know wine o'clock, laughing at the <laughs> laughing at the hillbillies. Like mm-hmm. that could be a fun story. I was just I just, <laughs> I just thought of the there there needs to be a change in dystopian and zombie fiction. I think you know going forward because everything is going to be electrified soon. Well, they'll figure it out. They'll, there will be writers that do this. This is the a lot of people thought. Oh, cell phones are going to ruin all movie plots. They've worked their ways around that. So right, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, they would have ruined the Blair Witch Project. That's for damn sure. <laughs> <laughs> Why did anybody bring GPS? <laughs> uh, I put a couple things in here, just quickies. Um, so, Radio Shack, who uh, long time. Do you have a Google know. alert set for Radio Shack, Dave? I do not, but that's a good idea. <laughs> I, I think you should. Say, you just gave me an <laughs> idea, Brian. <laughs> Yeah, I do not, but I should. Uh, Long-time listeners will know that I have great affection for Radio Shack. Uh, I worked for Radio Shack uh, in my college years, uh, which was a job that I had coveted all through my teen years. Um, I just thought Radio Shack would be the coolest place to work, which tells you everything you need to know about me as a teenager. And I really want to ask people for inf- inf- information they don't have to provide. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I want to hand them a free yeah. battery club card and <laughs> I ask have them one. for their address. <laughs> yeah. But, and so I got to have that job. It's a dream come true. I got to work at Radio Shack and I will say I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. It was a very good fit for me. I was good at helping people figure out how to wire up their VCRs so they could watch one show and record another. This was something I did pretty much every day when I worked at Radio Shack. So it was a good fit. Uh, and as we know, Radio Shack went out of business. They could not survive the transition. Um, at their peak, when I was working at Radio Shack, there were more Radio Shacks than McDonald's in the United that States. That is crazy. That yeah. is nuts. <laughs> yeah. Um, but turns out Radio Shack is still kind of around. Uh, they are a bit of a zombie brand, but there are still Radio Shack dealers who are selling Radio Shack branded stuff. And there's a new owner of Radio Shack who's planning on trying to relaunch the brand and reinvigorate the brand. There's a story here from the Wall Street Journal about how they're going to go about doing that. Um, I'm not going to dig too much into the details here, but I don't give them a whole lot of hope in in success. And certainly it's not going to be like it used to be. We'll never go back to that. But um, it'd be nice to see the brand be a strong brand that stands for something more than just crap. Right. <laughs> just where it is right now. <laughs> yeah. I would like to point out that uh, the three between the three of us, we all kind of had the jobs that we loved when we were younger. Brian worked at Disney. Mm-hmm. You worked at Radio Shack. Mm-hmm. And I worked at Kinko's. Ah. Those, those, those kind of define, I think, you know, a lot of who we are because we still talk about it to this day. I loved right. my time at Kinko's. When I was working at Kinko's, that's when it was uh, – um, they did the survey and it was the number one job to have for like, you know, under 20-year-olds in, okay. in the U.S. It mm-hmm. was a great job. I was Lots 24. of toys to play with. Oh, God, yes. I was 24 working the overnight shift, drunk oh, off my, my ass every night. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, Brian, was what was your jobs at Disney? Oh, well, it was actually very not glamorous, but uh, the side benefits were great. I was just bussing tables. It was the only, it was the only thing they let you do at 15 because I this started is, working there early. So This is at Disneyland? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, you know, back at that time, you could just go into the park anytime you wanted to. I could sign people in. You know, it was, it was great. It was right. awesome. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's, that is good. Uh, the last thing I have here, just because I saw this tidbit, this snippet from this article, and it made me <laughs> laugh, so I thought I would share. Uh, this is an article from Gizmodo. Um, and it's about – well, the title of the article is The College Board Tells TikTok and Facebook Your SAT Scores. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> so 
the the snippet from the article, uh, a college board spokesperson told Gizmodo, we do not share SAT scores or GPAs with Facebook or TikTok and any other third parties using Pixel or cookies. In fact, we do not send any personally identifiable information through our Pixels on the site. In addition, we do not use SAT scores or GPAs for any targeting. Next paragraph. After receiving this comment, Gizmodo shared a screenshot of the college board sending GPAs and SAT scores to TikTok using a pixel. The spokesperson then acknowledged that the college board's website actually does share this data. <laughs> this is uh, this is our world right now in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Surely we don't do that. We don't. Do that. Oh, of course no, we no. don't do we that. We wouldn't yes, dream doing, of doing, doing something that. like that. We're, we're totally yeah. doing that. Oh, <laughs> that. Oh, yes, absolutely. We do that. Sure. Yeah, yes. that we're doing. Come on. Of course we're doing that. <laughs> now, no, you meant the other thing that. Yeah. Now, right. cast your minds back maybe not more than 15 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. Th- this person would be fired immediately. Immediately. Right. We don't do that anymore. I guarantee they still have no. the job. Right. Yeah. Right. I think back to to how ignorant I was and I guess Pollyanna uh, in the early days of Facebook when I first signed up for Facebook Mm -hmm. and Facebook said, hey, good news. If you update your contacts list to us, we will use that to connect you with all your friends. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself (laughs) – well, that's a great idea. That sounds I would, great. This, this will make it so much easier to connect with all my friends. And it didn't even cross my mind that they were going to use it for bad things because why would anyone do that? Why would a company – they would sh- be shooting themselves in the foot if they would take all of my personal information and do that. And now it's <laughs> – Now it's it expected. Seems, right. It seems so adorable that – I mean I think back and how could I have thought that? But I think that's an example of the more innocent time – and how cynical we've become mm-hmm. in the passing decades. Well, yeah, you you must not have been around for the the early because there was another uh, basically scandal that rocked the internet before that, which was a company that did calendars and contacts, and they're like up, upload your contacts and we'll you know let your friends know that you're on the site, and then they can come and and be your friend on the site. And if you uploaded your contacts. They emailed everyone in your contacts that you were on the site and you couldn't stop it from that oh, point. Okay. It was a huge thing. So when Facebook started doing it, the us uh, old guard were just like, don't do that. <laughs> we just ran around telling our family, if right. it asked you that, do not do it. Do not do it. Just make sure you don't do it. Yeah. Five minutes later, oh, you did it, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. I mean, to what right. you just said, though, Dave, about being cynical, we're cynical for damn good reason. Yes, that's the it, thing. Yeah, it's, it's it, we're not being cynical just like, oh, fuck everything. It's it's totally justified. This right. is, right. All these companies do this to us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always ending on a high note here. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I'm going to yeah, go well, well, kick, a, okay. kick a puppy or something. I yeah. don't know. I'm going to go watch Osaka. I categorically do not kick puppies. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. I don't kick puppies, but cats, they've got it coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Please don't write in letters. I, I love all, I love all small furry animals. Yeah. Well, yeah we know that. <laughs> Closing shout out. Dan sent us in this great bit of feedback. Can't believe somebody did a charge back. It's a dick move. I hope they stub their toe. Thanks for the show. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> that is the most Canadian thing I've ever heard. I bet you're from Canada. I hope they stub their toe. <laughs> I, hope they, oh. I hope they get snotty. Yeah. Over at Patreon, we've got Ian, Josh, Jim, Uwe, Tiago, Green Bear, and Matthew. And Matthew says, I'm basically the same age as, same age as you both. Not a geek in the sense of having worked in tech, but always interested. Your quick take survey of the world is what keeps me listening. I'm way overdue showing my support beyond using your sponsorship links. So I'm doing something about it now. Keep it up. Well, thank you, Matthew. And thank you to everybody who signed up for Patreon. And by the way, quick update. Uh, the Spotify integration now works. So if you log into your Patreon account and you want to get the early release shows on your Spotify account, you can link the accounts right from the control panel. It works. I tried it. Ooh, cool. Yeah. For, for, <laughs> for once, something fucking works. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sure it'll break in the next update. I'm sure. Yeah. 
Over at PayPal, we've got Mike, Tom, Joseph, Mark, Morgan with 50 bucks, Kira with another 50 bucks, and Jason, 150 bucks. Woo! Thank you all so much. Thank you, everybody. Begging works. Begging works. And we're still not even close, so keep it coming, guys. Keep it coming. (laughs) Over the tip jar, we've got Karen, Ross, and Daryl for their subscription updates. And we got new subs from Josh, Eric, and Alden, and a big donation for 50 bucks from Nancy. So thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you all so much. We really do appreciate it. Yes, and we have some sad news this week. Co-founder of Adobe, Dr. John Warnock, has passed away. We would not have the desktop revolution if it wasn't for this guy and his uh, co-founder over at Adobe, Chuck Geschke. Uh, These guys created PostScript, which gave us laser printers, which gave us lots of really bad family newsletters. (laughs) Gave Gave me my job at Kinko's, which got me to the web, which got me to where I am today, so... Thank you, Dr. John and Dr. Chuck. I appreciate you. (laughs) Dude, I I would be in jail or dead if it wasn't for those guys. Fair enough. (laughs) And sadly, WWE legend Terry Funk has died at the age of 79. No clue who that is. Yes, well, a lot of people do. So this is for them, not you. (laughs) Little known fact, he also started Grand Funk Railroad. I wish, I wish. That would have been a much better story. Yes. (laughs) Until next time, I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. Thanks for listening to Grumpy Old Geeks. Show notes and links to everything we talked about today are at GOG.show slash 615. GOG.show slash donate is the place to drop us a few bills so we can keep bringing you this top-notch entertainment. Sharing the show with your friends, enemies, or anyone in between is free and can be almost as good as cash, but not really. At GOG.show, you can find a link to our Discord channel if you want to chat with us and other show fans. Head over to GOG.show slash contact and send us your feedback, comments, or links to cool shit you think we should talk about. GOG.show slash review is where you can toss us a review or preferably five stars that we can read on the air. Stay grumpy and keep farting. And stay caffeinated. Welcome to Boot Up with Jason for August 25th, 2023. I'm your host, Jason DeFilippo. Show notes can be found at bootup.show. The U.S. Department of Justice is taking Elon Musk's SpaceX to court, alleging the company discouraged refugees and asylees from applying for jobs, wrongfully stating that only U.S. citizens and permanent residents could be hired. This supposedly took place from September 2018 to May 2022. The lawsuit suggests SpaceX didn't just discourage these applicants, but also refused to hire those who applied. Furthermore, it's claimed that SpaceX only employed U.S. citizens and green card holders between 2018 and 2020. The case cites evidence, including remarks by Musk, who once said on a social media platform that hiring for SpaceX required at least a green card due to the nature of their work. The DOJ now seeks compensation for affected individuals and penalties for SpaceX. Those affected are being urged to come forward. Amazon's Prime Video is introducing several AI-driven features for the upcoming NFL Thursday night football season. Prime Video, holding exclusive rights for the second year, plans to change how fans watch the games. Features include defensive alerts that can predict defensive plays, prime targets indicating an open player, and field goal target zones, showing the likelihood of successful kicks. Additionally, Prime Video will exclusively stream the NFL's first Black Friday game between the Miami Dolphins and New York Jets, free for non-subscribers, with potential interactive shopping elements. Lastly, all Thursday night football viewers can expect enhanced HDR video quality, providing richer visuals without any change in settings. The new features debut on September 14th with the 2023 season kickoff. Starbucks is trialing Scanless Pay, a new contactless checkout option for drive through customers. Leveraging the user's geolocation via the Starbucks app, this innovation could eliminate the need for customers to show a barcode for payment, potentially streamlining the drive through experience. While the feature is still in the proof-of-concept phase among employees, if rolled out, it could expedite service, 
benefiting consumers, the company's bottom line, and people screaming that the overflowing lines are screwing up my morning commute. When used, customers would check in on the app upon arriving at a drive through share their name and order, and simply accept their items at the window, with payment automatically processed. This move further demonstrates Starbucks's foray into digital payment solutions, considering that in Q2 2023, its mobile order and pay system was responsible for a whopping 74% of U.S. company-owned revenue. While companies like Amazon explore similar tech, Starbucks' version might appeal to more users averse to biometric systems like the ones used at Whole Foods. I did ask the staff at my local Whole Foods how many people use the palm print checkout option, and not one of them have seen anyone use it in the wild. Go Starbucks! The British government is under scrutiny in the tech world for its stance on encryption and security updates. Amid concerns of jeopardizing iMessage and FaceTime, they're now hinting at potentially banning certain Apple security updates. Their new proposition requires tech companies to inform the government before implementing a security fix, and they could be denied if it plugs a gap used by security services. This sadly isn't new. The British administration has been looking to ban end-to-end encryption since 2017. Surprisingly, the country's former MI5 head voiced concerns, expressed in a BBC interview that while encryption can make security tasks challenging, it remains essential. Despite such warnings, the government seems keen on achieving surveillance without opening doors for malicious actors, a balance seen as unrealistic by experts and everyone else. Apple has gone so far as to suggest they'd pull iMessage and FaceTime from the UK over encryption disputes. Furthering concerns, the latest suggestion could make Apple await government permissions before patching vulnerabilities, a move seen as dangerous and nonsensical by critics. Apple usually learns of these security gaps when discovered by researchers or when exploited by hackers, so timely fixes are vital. End-to-end encryption isn't just a feature, but a foundational aspect of messaging apps, as demonstrated by Meta's significant overhaul to include it in Facebook Messenger. In light of these moves, one can only imagine the collective face palms echoing throughout the UK's tech sector. T-Mobile is cutting nearly 7% of its workforce, affecting about 5,000 corporate and technology roles. Retail and customer care positions remain untouched. This comes despite the company's promise of job growth after its Sprint merger in 2020. CEO Mike Sievert cites rising costs and the need to meet changing customer expectations. Layoff notifications will conclude by September's end with affected employees receiving severance. Open source AI model platform Hugging Face has secured major investments from tech giants, including Google, Amazon, NVIDIA, and Salesforce. In a Series D funding round, the company raised $235 million, rocketing its valuation to $4.5 billion. Hugging Face's CEO, Clement DeLang, emphasizes that this financial backing will expand their team and further investment in open source AI. He believes this move not only validates Hugging Face, but the broader open-source AI community, stressing that companies are eager to embrace AI and require open-source platforms to do so. Known for hosting top AI models, Hugging Face recently joined forces with Amazon's AWS, establishing AWS as its preferred cloud provider. While the term open-source can be confusing, In the AI landscape, it signifies a community-driven approach where companies often release models allowing developer experimentation within certain licensing parameters. Meta is moving to revitalize its failed Ray-Ban Stories smart glasses after reports of a 90% abandonment rate from purchasers. The second-gen Ray-Ban Stories are set to offer a unique feature— the capability to stream live video, where viewers can even audibly comment back to the streamer. According to tech journalist Janko Rotgers, the new glasses will support direct video streaming to platforms like Facebook and Instagram. They'll also feature improved battery life and better cameras. 
Additionally, the glasses will adjust audio playback based on ambient noise and discourage users from covertly recording by monitoring the glasses' recording indicator. There are concerns that this live streaming feature may lead to privacy invasions and controversial uses. Whatever gave you that idea? The second generation of Ray-Ban Stories is expected this fall with a third-gen version slated for 2025. The latter will introduce a small display for messages and text translations. Meanwhile, Meta's first dedicated AR glasses won't hit the market until 2027. Elon Musk recently unveiled the much-anticipated Cybertruck production candidate. However, a leaked email to his workforce reveals his dissatisfaction with its quality. Musk emphasized that due to the Cybertruck's distinctive design, any slight variation in its build would be highly noticeable. He urged for a precision in manufacturing down to sub-10 micron accuracy, comparing the production quality to that of Legos and soda cans. Critics, however, are questioning this level of precision and the comparisons made by Musk, given the difference in scale and the complexity of manufacturing a vehicle. Moreover, there's notable skepticism regarding the build quality of the Cybertruck, from apparent panel gaps to misaligned components. Despite these concerns, Tesla has approximately 2 million pre-orders for the Cybertruck. Achieving Musk's exacting standards for such a unique vehicle design may pose significant challenges for the Tesla team. The space above our planet is increasingly congested. Since 1957 Sputnik 1 launch, millions of objects from satellite parts to paint chips now orbit Earth. The clutter is so intense that the International Space Station frequently adjusts its orbit to avoid collisions. A concerning trend suggests that, unchecked, continuous collisions might create a Kessler cascade, which is a chain reaction where debris creates more debris, making space activities and satellite operations unsustainable. This scenario, depicted in movies like Gravity, warns of an orbital point of no return. To combat this, the European Space Agency and Swiss startup ClearSpace aim to launch a mission in 2026 to remove significant debris. However, recent data shows even their target, the Vega Secondary Payload Adapter, has unexpected surrounding debris, meaning it was hit by more debris. While the mission remains on track, it underscores the urgency and complexity of addressing our growing space debris challenge. That's it for today's Boot Up. Tune in Monday when we'll do it all again. Have a fantastic weekend, and if you like the show, share it with a friend. Hey.